you know, people came in, the security, and people started letting us know things were going wrong. Um, in Israel, things were happening, so it was devastating news. It's really horrible to hear, you know, when our people are murdered like that, you know, as you said, worst since the Holocaust. It's been a tough week in that sense, but at the same time, we know that the Jewish people are stronger than ever, and however much people think that this will divide us, it brings us together. I'm here with our local St. Petersburg Chabad rabbi, Rabbi Mendel Leibovich. We're going to be speaking about all things Judaism. We're going to be touching on the war, which was I was not expecting. No one was expecting to kick off before we even scheduled this thing. And hopefully answering a lot of the questions that I'm curious about as an American Jew and that a lot of other people are curious about as well. So, Rabbi, thank you for joining me for this episode. This is a unique opportunity for me. So thank you for being here. Thank you for spending some time with our audience. My pleasure. Thank you, Jay. This is my first podcast, so it's exciting. And uh, <laughs> happy to be doing it with you. We'll go easy on you. First podcast, exciting for me, taking your podcast virginity in a way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Rabbi, I feel like I'd be doing a, a disservice to the Jewish community if we didn't start off by acknowledging uh, what's going on in the world right now. It is currently October 16th. I think we've been about 10 days into the current conflict. More than a thousand Israelis have died, more than any day since the Holocaust. So, I want to acknowledge. Uh, you and anyone who's listening who has friends or family has been affected by this. What, what was your initial reaction when you saw the events that occurred on the, the day of the attack? It's been a really tough week in that sense. You know, we were actually on the, during the holiday of Simchat Torah. It was the end of the Sukkot holiday. It's an eight-day holiday, which we celebrate here and in Israel. And it was Shabbat in Israel, as well as the last day, Simchat Torah. And the attacks, you know, we were in synagogue and we aren't, we're, we're off the grid on our holidays, so I couldn't access my phone, but you know, people came in, the security, and people started letting us know things were going wrong. Um, in Israel, things were happening, so it's really, it, it was devastating news. It's really horrible to hear, you know, when our people are murdered like that, you know, as you said, worst since the Holocaust. It's been a tough week in that sense, but at the same time, we know that the Jewish people are stronger than ever, and however much people think that this will divide us, it brings us together, and Am Yisrael Chai, and we're going to continue to be strong. We're never going to give up. We're never going to back down, and the Jewish people will be strong forever. Yeah, it's 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 funny and it's ironic. I've never felt more Jewish than when something like this happens. So if their goal was to unite us, they they succeeded. Am Israel Chai. I, I've been hearing that a lot. What does that mean? Am Yisrael Chai. The nation of the Jewish people will live. That's exactly what it means. You know, people have tried killing us for thousands of years since the beginning of time, from Pharaoh through Hitler. They've tried to destroy us. They're in the dustbin of history, mm. and here we are, shining, shining like never before, and we'll continue to be strong past these people and past anybody else that tries to destroy us. It's been amazing to see all of the support from all over the world, every major city and organization flying the flag of Israel during this. So it seems like most of the world, they understand that Israel is mostly trying to defend itself and to exist in such a small piece of land. But I also made a post on my Instagram in support of Israel and saw a lot of backlash, a lot of people that I respect in, in everyday life, doctors who are chanting free Palestine. I think is Israelis are murderers. I actually had a Palestinian on the podcast to try and get into their mind and understand why they thought the way that they thought. Uh, because I understand people can be brainwashed, people can be a groom to think certain things from a young age, their families and friends are all regurgitating the same messages. Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think the, the hostility towards Israel comes from? That they can't see the clear evil and aggression of Hamas, not all past the Palestinians, but Hamas. So, I mean, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge, I saw the post and I saw the stuff that was going on and I actually watched the podcast you did. Thanks. Um, and I thought it was very interesting, you know, the, the, the guy he was speaking to, um, acknowledged the disaster, barbaric nature of the attacks that Hamas did. And really, I would say most, I don't know what the numbers are, but high, high percentage, most people in the civilized world understand that this was an attack on Jewish people. Worst possible way, as you said, since the Holocaust, you know. And so I would say most people do support, understand that this was a barbaric in nature. But at the same time, you know, there's like this whole separate conversation, which I, I was interesting when I was listening to, your, to the podcast. I thought, you know, it's really, there's two, there's two subjects here which are obviously connected. But I was listening to somebody yesterday, Douglas Murray, mm. beautiful speaker, a beautiful speech he gave yesterday. And he, he, he said that he has many Jewish friends ranging from ultra-Orthodox Chabad to conservative reform. And he said, while, you know, those differences mean a lot to the people who are within those, within those groups, 
Hamas didn't care. Right. Hamas went for you if you were a Jew. That's the only thing they cared about. Just like the Nazis, if you were a Jew, they want to kill you. End of story. And so that has to be eradicated. That I, I mean, this idea, unfortunately, it's been around for thousands of years. Anti-Semitism has been around forever. And so that idea, we have to push completely eradicate it from this world as best as we can back to the people that support the civilians that didn't do this the civilians that are being harmed by the atrocities that Hamas is committing it's a long ongoing conflict that as Jews we have a very strong held belief in the ownership of the holy land of Eretz Yisrael that God gave it to us from Abraham all the way to and he gave it to us as our inheritance to have forever and so that's our very strong held belief other people have other beliefs and that's okay for them to have but as Jewish people, we have to understand that our strong belief is in that the nation of the, 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 the land of Israel is ours, it's nobody else's, and the safety of the Jewish people comes first. I think uh, one of the smartest things uh, Israel and the Israel coalition ever did was birthright, because they brought all of the, the Jewish, Jewish Americans to Israel and built that connection uh, to Israel. And I think that's one of the reasons they have such, such broad support. Because it's a country half the way around the world that normally you wouldn't have any attachment to. But it's just so, such an interesting thing how attached all Jewish Americans feel to Israel that have gone on that birthright trip. Uh, so it's, it, it really is a beautiful thing, and I hope they continue that program indefinitely. Uh, let me ask you, as an American Jew who does feel that attachment to Israel, what should we be thinking right now? What should we be doing to support our, our Israelites who are fighting anti-Semitism, fighting for their lives? Right. So somebody, I saw somebody post the other day that they were getting asked, do you have any family in Israel? Yes. And the answer is we have 8 million siblings, brothers and sisters, Jewish brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. And we, every single one of us has the obligation to be on the front lines. Not necessarily can we be on the front lines like the soldiers who we're praying for to be able to defend the homeland in that way. But we have our own way of doing that. Whether that's in, in the biggest way is by connecting to our Judaism, being proud of who we are, Doing a mitzvah, putting on tefillin, putting up mezuzah on your house, you know, the uh, for women to light Shabbat candles before we'll talk Shabbos. About all of those things in detail. We'll talk about people them. People are very curious. Go ahead. All these things, these mitzvot, these ways to connect to God mm -hmm. and that connect us with our Judaism. That is the because we know that Hashem, God, it says, "Ein Hashem Hashana that the eyes of God are over the land of Israel from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. God watches for the whole world. But as a special place, Israel has a special place in God's eyes. And we know that if we connect to God and we do more to connect to our Judaism, that is the ultimate weapon against our enemies. So every single person, every single Jew, and really every human being has the ability to fight for the Jewish people, to be able to make this world a lighter, brighter place. Um, and so that's the way we can do it. That's the way we can fight. Yeah. In, a, in my effort to understand other people's the way that they think about Jews, about Judaism, about Israel, started asking a few questions. And, and one that I was curious about, I'm curious to hear your point of view, is where the anti-Semitism really comes from. Because normally you see racism as that person looks different, uh, they act different, uh, so we shouldn't like them. I, 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 in my belief, that's the foundation of racism. But Jews typically look like you know most people in America, most people where anti-Semitism occurs, uh, generally act the same, but people just hate Jews. Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think it stems from? It comes, I, in my opinion, it comes all the way down to the soul, to the soul level. At the end of the day, what makes the Jewish people the Jewish people? It's a fascinating idea where you have, what are the Jewish people? What are we? Are we a religion? We're not necessarily a religion. You have a lot of Jews that are not religious. But nevertheless, they're Jewish people. So is it a race? It's not a race. You have Jewish people from all races, race, race and ethnicities. Yes. Is it a culture? You have... Uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll talk about it, but you know, you have all types of cultures. You have Moroccan culture, and American culture, Israeli culture, Spanish culture, tons of different cultures in the Jewish people. So what is it? Is it a nationality? It's not a nationality. You're, you, you could convert into Judaism, right? So what is it? At the end of the day, Judaism is about our soul. Every Jew has a special Jewish soul. Everybody has a soul, but Jewish, Jewish people have a specific, a special Jewish soul that God gave us. And when God gave us a Mount Sinai, and God embedded within us that Jewish soul at Mount Sinai that made us different from everybody else and whether we like it or not we don't necessarily as Jews we don't love to admit it that we have this this soul it doesn't necessarily make us special it makes us more responsible to be able to be a, a better a better a better people a better person in, in our lives and to be a light unto the nations 
but having that uh, just innate difference within us unfortunately causes this causes this hate and um, as long as there are people around that don't have that there, there's going to be this hate unfortunately and it's our job to be proud of who, who we are so that way we can fight back I agree with you. I like that we started that conversation about what is a Jew, because that's a conversation that I've had with a lot of my Jewish and non-Jewish friends. Uh, to be transparent, I'm a, I'm a Reformed Jew. I don't practice a lot of the religious forms of Judaism, but I definitely identify as a Jew, and I know a lot of Jews who think the way that I do. And I try and explain that to my friends. I'm like, well, if you're, you don't believe and practice Judaism, how can you be a Jew? And I always thought about it, like, what makes me a Jew outside of, you know, celebrating the holidays and doing the mitzvot? And in, in my argument, it was kind of a set of values, a set of principles that I was raised with that I share in common with most other Jews. But is there an answer that might be more tangible than what's in the soul for what defines a Jew, whether it be culturally, which Ben Shapiro makes the argument that Judaism isn't just a religion, it's a culture? Uh, do you agree with that, or do you disagree with that, and why? I think you can have reasons, and you can say that it's a culture, and that Judaism has a way of life, and the Torah, the Old Testament, is our, in, gui is our, is our guidebook, instruction manual for life. And those values, which a lot of Western values are based off, you know, those things are, are, are where we get our values and our culture from. Um, so I would agree in that sense that we do have a special culture, and we do have a special a special connection and, and, a, and a way and a value that are that that make us special but at the end of the day a lot of people share certain values and culture changes from here to there and so i think at the end of the day you're going to be left with the the soul and that's where it comes down to and there's my jewish dog moses, moses. coming out of the corner hey moses <laughs> so rabbi i actually invited you on the podcast probably a month ago now maybe even yeah. more before everything happened. And the questions that I had for you were a lot more fun and lighthearted. So I'm glad we started on, on the deep, uh, sometimes painful stuff to talk about. Now I'd love to talk about some of the more interesting, fun, lighthearted questions that I was wondering about Judaism. Cause like I said, I'm reform. Uh, I wasn't educated on all of the holidays, all of the, the customs of the different sects of Judaism and, and some of those, the, the values and traditions that they uphold. So is it okay if we absolutely. have some fun, talk about some... Absolutely. It's about joy. Some Jewish we have to Q &A. Serve, we have to serve. We have to be joyous in our lives. If we're depressed and down, we can't get anything done. We have to be joyous. Even in hard times, we have to find where there is to, be, to, to have joy um, and change our mindset. If, it, if, it, if we're having a hard time with it, we have to focus on giving ourselves a po positive mindset. And so, absolutely. All right, I love that. Before I uh, go into the Jewish Q&A, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background just so people can get kind of familiarized with where you grew up, how you sure. grew up. Tell me a little bit about you. Sure, so I am the oldest of 10 children. It's a lot of children. A lot of siblings, thank God, seven it's boys. Contraception is not appropriate in the Jewish Contraception is generally, is generally frowned upon, yes. It's, uh, it's, we believe that children is a beautiful thing. Ch children are the future. And um, so absolutely, so... My parents are amazing people, and they raised us. We have seven, one of seven boys, three girls. Um, grew up in South Florida, about a uh, little city called Inverary. I always love telling people, a place that nobody ever heard of. Nope, I'm from Florida, never heard of it. Inverary, actually where Jackie Gleason um, had his like bunch of stuff there. He has a golf course name over there named after him. The hotel has all his stuff. It's an interesting um, Is there an Orthodox nice community in the So there wasn't. And actually, my grand so uh, the reason I grew up there is my grandfather moved there 40 years ago um, to to be the rabbi for the small Orthodox con congregation that was there, which now has bloomed into this beautiful Orthodox community with over 200 families. So Great. it's a really cool uh, little like shtetl in South Florida. Shtetl. There's a little, little, uh, it's, you mean you see like Jewish kids running on the streets on Shabbat yeah. and playing with each other. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful Great. site. That's where I grew up. And then I went off to yeshiva in, uh, as I, when I was 14 years old, ninth grade, um, went to Chicago for a couple years. Spent three years there, and then went off to Toronto as a Floridian. I really got to get in the cold, the winters in Chicago and Toronto. Got to see snow for the first time when I was 15. It was very exciting. Um, and then I was went off to uh, went to New York for a year, and then actually went back to Chicago to um, to be a student teacher in the yeshiva where I was a student, which was a really cool experience. And then I finished my uh, rabbinical yeshiva studies in Los Angeles, um, and so that's where I that's where I grew up. And then I got married a year later and lucky enough to move here to St. Petersburg uh, where we, my wife and I, uh, we run the youth and young professional programs here. 
So well, we're lucky yeah. to have you. Thank God. Glad we're you lucky moved. to have you. What was it like growing up in an Orthodox home, and how was it different? Do you think from traditional families growing up in Florida? I mean, I only know what I grew up in. So I mean, it was an amazing, amazing childhood. Thank God. Um, a loving, loving family, and parents. Um, you know, family is everything to us, and just whether it's Shabbat, spending together the holidays, and actually have a couple of cousins that live, because as I said, my grandfather um, started it there, so a couple, of a, whole, a little bit of a of extended family that lived there, and we would be around with our cousins on Shabbat, and it would be a really, it was a really, it was a really fun, enjoyable childhood. My father's a cantor, and there's a lot of singing, and so sitting around the table, just belting away all types of songs, Jewish songs, and songs that we know. Um, so that, I mean, and different in the sense that there's a clear sense that we're different and we're proud of that difference. You know, we understand that being an Orthodox Jew is something that very, very, very small minority of, uh, of people in the world, as in America and the world are Orthodox Jews and Jews in general, but even more so Orthodox Jews and Chabad. And it's, it's a really, it was a, it was a pride, a pride in that, that we're able to, uh, keep to our traditions that have been going on for thousands of years and continue that on. And so my grandfather's a rabbi, my father's a rabbi, and I was able to become a rabbi. I knew I was going to be a rabbi from when I was uh, from a child. So, Was it ever difficult growing up Orthodox? Say you're in middle school and, I mean, you're not in the middle of Brooklyn with these massive Orthodox communities. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it strange in school? Was there anything that you needed to be accommodated for? What was that like? So actually, we, we went to Orthodox schools, Jewish Orthodox schools our whole life. So in that sense, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't to have much accommodation in that sense. Um, and all my friends were all were were uh, Orthodox Jews growing up. We had you know we had, we had neighbors, so it was always fun. You know we had our, a couple neighbors. I remember one of one of our couple doors down, Corey, a really really nice guy who would just b b played basketball in high school. Not a Jewish guy, not a Jewish boy, and we used to play basketball whenever we got home from school and we had a blast. Just and we were different, which was fine. You know everyone yeah. we had our differences and we played basketball and we had a blast. But it helps but being in the community. Absolutely. Uh, what about values? Do you think you had any specific values instilled in you at your Jewish schools or from your parents, whether that be uh, working hard, keeping tradition, dating? Tell me a little bit about the Jewish values that Orthodox families instill in their, in their children. A strong sense of tradition and a sense of we're continuing on the legacy of our forefathers for, mm. the, pa for the past 3,000 years and really that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Giants came before us and have kept to their tradition even in the hardest of times, whether it was back in, in, in Inquisition times of Spain, whether it was in Egypt, or whether it was in World War II. And here we are in America, and we have the freedom to be able to live as and live proudly as a Jew. Um, that ability was something always very special. Other values that we grew up with, it's funny you mentioned dating, just got me thinking, my, my, happens to be my mother is a matchmaker. And a matchmaker in the Chabad community. Convenient. So I uh, the best match. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but I also so I, I was always around. My mother was always you know on the phone talking to people, discussing. Um, in the Chabad community, it's much more common people that to, to date and to go out to see if it, to see if it works and to make sure you know. And there's a lot of um, date. Uh, my mother was like sat, half matchmaker, half dating coach. So a lot of coaching going on and just hearing about all those values was. Uh, so I got in yeshiva. I was. I was the go-to guy for anybody had any questions in uh, in, any, in dating, but um, have you seen the the new Netflix series about Jewish matchmaking? I've heard about it. What's your I, opinion? Have you have you watched? I haven't that watched episode? the full thing. Damn, I saw, I gotta I saw, get you. I, I saw some clips. I know my mother. I asked my mother about it. I like, knew Ma, what do you think about it? Because yeah. my mother's a matchmaker. She says she she does a great job and um, she has a really good attitude about it. And that was was cool to see. I know she's been going around um, speaking in different young professional communities about the importance of Jewish marriage. And um, so I think it was, it was just cool to think. What is Jewish dating and marriage like? I mean, do you have a choice? Is it, it's the matchmakers say, the final say? What is the courting process? So every community is different. I would say within, you know, within Orthodox Judaism, there are different communities. And some communities that it's, it's less, it's more, it's a little bit more set up. Mm -hmm. um, again, to the degrees within each community. Right. Um, in our community, that's what I could speak for. It's it's a real um, the idea is that you're dating for marriage. The value is that you date for we date for marriage. We don't date just because, um, and therefore at the time when you're ready to start looking for a wife or a husband, um, your parents would be would start looking around and you know asking asking uh, matchmakers and or friends or cousins if they know anybody that would be suitable for their 
child. And once you find a suitable name and the research is done and it makes sense um, on paper, so then they go out. And, you know, my wife and I, uh, a, a mutual friend of both of our mothers, knew us both and set us up when we were in New York. We went out. And we went out for about a month and a half, two months. And the big idea is that you go out, you're going out, with the cl- again, with the clear intention of marriage. You don't go out just to have fun. You go out right from the beginning, maybe the first date, just to see if you could even talk to each other. But um, after that, it's really, let's, let's, count, let's, d- let's get down to, okay, do we have similar values? Do we have similar outlooks in life? And once that all matches up, and then there's a feeling, there's a connection, there's a chemistry, so then it's yalla. So yalla. let's get married. Let's do it. Uh, we don't spend months and months or years Dating just to see, you know, and Jewish marriage is uh, it's a beautiful thing. There's there's the there's the laws of uh, family purity, which is a whole. Is this subject. like the Christian kind of biblical way of getting married? You don't have sex no, until marriage, and then you so christen it. Is it kind of the similar? In that sense, yes. I mean, in, in Judaism, in, in by we don't in Orthodox Judaism, there's no um, there's no touch whatsoever before marriage. That would be including, including sex. So uh, yeah, that's all. That's all. Wait up till up till the wedding. Within the intimacy of a marriage. There's a, there's a special laws within Judaism about when 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 and how um, husband and wife can be together. Tell me about um, those laws. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> um, it's what's called it's called family purity. Family purity is the laws of what we call also the laws of mikvah, and the idea is that a husband and wife, uh, the connection and the intimacy between a husband and wife is the most powerful and the most holy union that there could be in the world. We, we learned that the union between God and, 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 his, and God and people is similar to that idea of, of a husband and wife coming very together. Pure. It's very pure. Okay. And we want to keep it in the purest of, in the purest of sense. And the laws are not meant to be constricting in general. Laws are not meant to be constricting. They're meant to be ways of doing uh, guidebooks for how to live the most meaningful life. And so practically um, for two weeks of every month, when a woman is on her period, we don't have, in, and there's no intimacy. That's fair. And the idea is that there's a misinterpretation that people say that it's mm. n- unclean and we can't have sex when the woman's unclean, which is really not true. Um, it's it's a level of it's impurity. You know, the a period is the end of the of a life cycle. That there was not that abili- uh, that ability for life. There's 12 days. There's a whole process. For 12 days, the end of the 12 days, the woman goes to a ritual bath, which um, is a very very holy and special experience. Um, which the 12th day is usually the most fertile time for a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once that, that once that ritual bath is done, then husband and wife can resume being together. Um, so that's the gen- that's like a general uh, Seems like that kind of goes hand in hand with the no contraception rule. The intention of having sex is to, to procreate and make more Jewish babies. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, but at the same time, one of the uh, foundational of the, the, the marriage contract between a husband and a wife mm. The, the Judaism is the first, the first religion, the first culture to have a contract where the husband has to give certain things to his wife, and one of those things is intimacy. Intimacy is not just for children; it's also to create a, a bond within the relationship. I think that's a good rule. But uh, I mean, this idea of two weeks on and off—it's been. Uh, I mean, nowadays you have sci- you have psychologists and sex therapists talking about how it's a really good, uh, it's a great way of keeping the marriage fresh, and uh, you know you don't have it for two weeks, and then be able to go right back to it in a very in a, an exciting way that you didn't have before. Yeah, I can I can be on board with that. While we're on the topic of marriage contracts, yeah. do you off the top of your head, or you can make a guess, know what the divorce rate is amongst the Orthodox Jewish community? I don't know off the top of my head. Do you know um, a lot of divorced people in your community? Unfortunately, it's been growing comparatively, but at the same time, it is minuscule. Compared to the rest of the rest of civilization, the rest of America for sure. Right. I, I mean, not civilization, it's but like sixty uh, percent now. Yeah, most, it's most unfortunately, America. it's very very high, and 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 the real reason is because that our focus is marriage is a beautiful marriage is a beautiful thing, and the focus from the beginning is marriage. You know, when when it goes back to the, our dating conversation, when you're when the focus of the date is to see if we have things in common, and to see that our 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 minds are alike, and you know, we have similar goals in life, so then. When things come up in life, you're able to work on those things together versus if the whole connection is attraction and we both like going hiking. OK, let's get married. And we, I like the way you look at you, like the way I look. So then comes and a big situation happens in life a couple years down the road, which is bound to happen and things can unravel. So it really goes back down to the basics. But, yeah, I mean, thank God it is much, much, much less in the 
Jewish and Orthodox community. And you think the reason that it's more successful in the Orthodox community is because of intent? You're both going in to get married because you have aligned values, not because you picked that person because they were hot? 100% A, and we value marriage. It's, it, we, there's an extreme value in, in the institution of marriage that other people don't necessarily have. Well, thank you. All right, let's start working my way down this list. Okay. Um, you became a rabbi. You, you've known you wanted to be a rabbi for a long time. What does a rabbi do, and what is the path like to becoming one? And I'd also love to know what sacrifices that you have to make as a rabbi. As an example, priests can't get married. I know that's not the case for rabbis, but maybe there's something. Tell me a little bit about that journey and what rabbis do. Um, yes, I mean, becoming a rabbi is not as complicated as it sounds. Um, it's a lot of learning, and you know, you're learning a lot about the about the Jewish religion, Jewish culture, about the Jewish laws, learning the Talmud, the Mishnah, the different books that are uh, that the Jewish people have had for thousands of years, and then really at the end, it's be, it's really getting getting um, a clear understanding of the practical day to day Jewish laws, whether it's kosher, whether it's um, Shabbat. Practical day-to-day -day laws and a lot of laws. There's a lot of holidays. A lot, so exactly sure right. A decent amount of learning that goes into it. There's a, a minimum. I mean, you have to have been in for eight years. Wow. So it's a yeah. You have a, it's a long time of learning, but at the end, it's to focus really on the practical mo the laws that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's, I guess, a further process, um, which is really for it's a long conversation, but the uh, becoming a rabbi in a, for a, a pulpit rabbi, you know, and becoming um, being able to answer new modern questions that come up that that are uh, based obviously the foundations have been laid in the torah and in the bible but um come to questions that come up and that's that's what that's a further process at this point i'm just i'm still just a regular rabbi so what is the uh, function of a regular rabbi what's your day-to-day -day life like day-to-day -day life um you know i mean just like a regular orthodox jew is you know waking up praying in the morning and spending time throughout the day to learn um learn torah um, and then, being that I'm a rabbi specifically in the in, in the Chabad rabbi, and I and I and I focus on the youth, young professional communities here in St. Pete, so it's meeting with people and you know going out for coffee, discussing discussing Judaism, discussing life thoughts, becoming having connections, relationships with people, and being there for them in their in their happy times and in their not such happy times. Um, just on Friday, I was you know I went on first to put up a mezuzah and uh, a, a, on, on somebody's house, somebody's door. And we got to talk a little bit, and then right after that, I went to somebody whose grandfather unfortunately just passed away to go comfort him and speak to him, you know, about Jew the the Jewish perspective in death and in mourning. So, a Jewish servant of the community, it sounds like. Do my best. Yeah, that's a uh, that's an honorable honorable profession. What sacrifices do you think you have to make to to be a rabbi? Is there a vow of poverty, a vow of celibacy? So no, we don't have any of such any such uh, any such things, and honestly. I don't see it as a sacrifice. I mean, I see it as the... It's as a, a sacrifice to everything you want to do. A sacrifice to everything, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. you, on, on Saturdays, when other people are off work, I'm not off work, you know? Right. I'm, 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 20, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the job 24-7. In that sense, that's a sacrifice. But to me, it's, a, it's the ultimate... Um, it's, 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 it's a really special uh, work to be able to connect with the J Jewish people and the community at large that um, it's, worth, it's worth every so this quote-unquote sacrifice there is. But uh, there isn't any of the sacrifices that other, like uh, celibacy or these type of things. Right. There's a couple tools of the rabbi that you've brought by a couple times. Some I'm familiar with, some I'm not. I'd love to talk about a few of those tools, the things that people might see in Jewish movies that they're like, what the hell is that? Let's shed some light on those things. One of them you brought today is tefillin. Yep. Uh, if you're listening or watching, you may have seen Jews uh, with, the black thread around their arms and box on their forehead. Uh, Mendel, what it, what is tefillin? Why is it significant? So I just you said the rabbi's tools. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that in a little Please. bit in the sense that it's a Jewish religious object. It's not a rabbi specifically. Every single Jewish man puts should put on tefillin every day. You know, it's Why? a mitzvah in the Torah. The Torah uh, God commanded the Jewish people that you should have on your arm and on your head a sign that reminds you of God. So it says the it says in, it says in the Shema the Shema prayer it talks about wearing a wearing a sign on your arm and on your head and then the Rabbi the Moshe Rabbeinu Moses at Sinai was given the instructions that means the tefillin the black boxes with the black with the black leather straps and you put those on um, in the mornings or before sundown at latest 
make us you make and you pray to God. Some people will put it on for a minute to make a small prayer. Some people put it on for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, just to to pray the whole morning prayers in the tefillin. That's what I do. And then um, there are even some people you'll go to Israel, you'll see in Jerusalem and some yeshiva, some some centers of learning where they wear the tefillin the entire day. Wow. Um, because it's a, it's a it's again that the the tefillin is a reminder of the connection between it's connecting your mind and your heart to Hashem and so and to God and so you want to. Uh, for those people, it's um, it's while they're learning, they want to continue that connection. So okay, th- very good. And that black box, is there anything inside of that black box? Yeah, so there's scrolls. There's the arm, the arm tefillin has one scroll, and the head tefillin has four scrolls, and in it is the is biblical verses that talk about this, b- written by a scribe, um, very specific instructions on how to write it and, and so on. And those and those scrolls, sorry, are um, th- those verses about talking about the tefillin and talking about Guarding the Jewish people, actually, if we go back a little bit to the idea of Israel, you know, putting on tefillin has a strong connection to the safety of the Jewish people. It says, it speaks about in the Torah that when the Jewish people will put on the tefillin, it will scare the nations of the world away. And so, again, this idea that when a person, when a Jewish man puts on tefillin in the morning, um, it has a very, it connects him to God and it does this, uh, and it creates a safety net for the Jewish people in general. So if you're Jewish and you want to connect to God, this is something that you should do once a day before the sun goes down. Once a day before the sun goes down, as long as it's not on a holiday. Holidays and Shabbat, we don't put on tefillin. No tefillin on holidays, no tefillin on Shabbat. Exactly. Lots of rules. But thank Jay, you. Will, Jay will put on tefillin afterwards. I, pr- I guarantee it. If you want to see me put on tefillin, uh, check out the, the end of this episode. Stick Perfect. around till the end. The shofar, you brought this to our, our last coffee meeting and you, you played or blew the shofar for me. So thank you for that. It was beautiful. Uh, what is the significance of the shofar? Explain the shofar, please. And just remember that when I blew it for you, all of a sudden we had somebody at the other end of the coffee shop turn around and go, Shana Tova. Yes. They recognize the Jewish, the shofar. The, uh, so the j- shofar is the mitzvah. Like on Hanukkah, we light the menorah. So on the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. Mm. So it's the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is to blow the shofar. It speaks about it in the, in the Bible that on the, mitzvah, on, the, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, you should blow the shofar. Now, it represents the idea. It represents two main things in Rosh Hashanah. It represents the crowning of God as the King of the of the of the, of the universe, and crowning, crowning God as our King in the new year. As the Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. It also there's the blowing of the shofar, and the different sounds represent different cr- types of cries. There's the long and the short and the different blasts, and um, all of those are connected with the idea of Rosh Hashanah is and Yom Kippur is the idea of rep- repentance. Um, for what we've done in the past year and hoping for a, a good year. And re- more than just repentance, it's returning, returning to ourselves. Um, when we come in the new, we come come at Rosh Hashanah, we come at Yom Kippur, and we want to turn, return to who we really are. And uh, shofar, the cries of the shofar help us get there. And what is it made out of? It uh, looks like a horn. I know there's different types of shofars, but what is it made from? How do you get one? Yeah, so it's an, a, a shofar is a kosher shofar. It's from a kosher animal. It has a horn. Um, the most used one is the ram horn, the ram's horn. That's mm-hmm. the one that we blew. There are all types of animals that have kosher animals that have horns, whether it's a ram, antelopes, um, and so you know people. Uh, there, are, there are special uh, people that get the chauffeurs from the animals, um, and they get cleaned and made to ready to blow, and then. They're hard to blow. I've tried to blow one of these things before. No sound came out. Not like when you were able to do it. So it's very, uh, very impressive. Some chauffeurs are than, easier than others, <laughs> and it takes practice to get it the right sound. But it's not hard to learn. Uh, you mentioned it comes from kosher animals. Yes. Kosher wasn't on my list, but we're, we're very curious about kosher here. Do you keep kosher? I do. Tell me about a kosher diet. What makes a food kosher? Great question. Um, also because there's a lot of misconception when it comes to kosher. Um, I had somebody call me, one of the other young adults in the community called me the other day and um, was saying his boss wants to make one of the uh, products in the company kosher. Rabbi, can you come over, bless the food, and make it kosher? I'm like, that's <laughs> unfortunately, that's not how things become kosher. My blessing means no difference mm. to how it becomes kosher. I also thought that you needed a rabbi in there to bless the food to make so it kosher. You need a rabbi there, but not for, to bless the food. Gotcha. And the reason is like this. Kosher, all kosher means is the kosher dietary laws that God gave that certain Foods were allowed to eat, and certain ones foods were not allowed to eat. You know, and whether it's when it comes to um, when it comes to f- the within meat, and when it comes to animals, there are certain animals, animals that the the the, the law of, of of regular animals is if it chews its cut and has split hooves, then it's a kosher animal. Interesting. And then 
that if it's an animal that has to be slaughtered in the proper humane way that the Jewish people have, then it's a kosher. Then it will be then it will be considered a kosher animal. So the for kosher the animal has to be kosher. But for example, to get the shofar, you don't need to slaughter it. To eat it, it needs to be slaughtered properly. Right. But if it has um, and then when it comes to fish, you have fins and scales. If it has fins and scales, it's kosher. So salmon kosher, tilapia kosher, shark not kosher doesn't have scales, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and then when it comes to birds, it's any, any vulturous, vulturous, uh, anything that eats other birds or eats other, eats other, eats meat, basically. Yes. Then, um, then it's not a kosher animal, uh, not a kosher bird. But if it's a bird that doesn't eat other animals, then it would be a kosher bird. And those are probably less, less of a problem most of the time, right? People don't eat vultures. Yeah. P- people yeah. eat chickens, which 100%. don't eat other birds. But at the same time, a chicken, birds have to, be, unlike a fish, fish is easier than chicken and than, than right. birds. People aren't eating and, sharks or dolphins either. But also uh, um, um, birds and animals have to be slaughtered properly. So Jewish kosher meat is typically more humane meat it's, it was slaughtered in the most humane po- way possible. Okay, I didn't know that. Yes, That's uh, one more incentive to pay a couple extra bucks for a kosher piece of meat. Absolutely. So my in, uh, the things that I know I, ca- I can't eat if I want to keep a kosher diet are pork, mm-hmm. lobster, and any c- type of crab or crustacean. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And then the hardest one is, you probably know, it's the meat and cheese together. Mm. That Never have I ever been so scolded by somebody's look when I was in Israel trying to order a cheeseburger. We they don't have fake cheesy burgers in we Israel. We don't have that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as one of the besides for those three things, well, those animals, mm. there's meat and milk can't be mixed together as well. It's another one of the biblical uh, prohibitions or biblical commandments for kosher, and that anything that's kosher in the supermarket, and that if an idea m- what makes it kosher is the rabbi was there to make sure that any of these prohibited items aren't in the food. Right. So the rabbi is not blessing it. He's just making sure that none of the prohibited items are there, or that it was giving a stamp of approval official. that it's a kosher, a kosher food, or something like that. Can so any like, rabbi do that? No. Are you authorized to give your stamp of approval on food? What, is, no. what does it take to become so that rabbi? There's special training and special, special. You have to become an expert rabbi, especially today in the modern era. Yeah. There's so much these these rabbis that are. You, if you look on, you go online, you see some of these videos that these expert rabbis they're scientists. I mean, they're full-on scientists to, to know what goes into the modern era of foods and the chemicals and the different things that go into these things and what is what makes a kosher product today. So I mean, unless you're going to the store and you're buying an apple or you're buying a fresh salmon right off the shelf. Do you have special kosher places that you go and buy your groceries, go to dinner? Yeah. I mean, in, in St. Pete, we don't have that many of, uh, of them. Business opportunity. <laughs> I mean, we need a lot of we need some more Jews, but maybe in St. Petersburg it's a little not as easy to find uh, kosher food as it is in other places, Israel, New York, South Florida, and so on. But you know, you have some stores in the city, whether it's Win Dixie in Tampa or Joel's in in St. Petersburg, that um that have that have that are that have kosher items, and so um that's where we can find it. You know, we my wife and I we and Chabad here generally imports from South Florida, like a shipment every six months, a big shipment of all kosher meat and milk that we can get because it's a little harder to get down here so we mentioned a a lot of stuff here and there's a lot of different levels of judaism i guess i would consider myself reform you would consider yourself orthodox honestly we're both jews yes the the labels i don't i don't love the labels in the sense that we'll talk about it but every jew is a jew you know it doesn't make a difference if you grew up reform conservative orthodox all types left right you're a jew we're both jews it all comes down to that now diving a little deeper into that, there's <laughs> different levels deeper, absolutely. of acknowledgement to the different Jewish communities. traditions. Yes, absolutely. Um, tell me about some of those communities. What are they? What are they called? And what are some of their signatures and highlights that people can think about? So I can only really speak strongly for my own community, the Orthodox and specifically Chabad Orthodox community, which I grew up in. But in reality, you know, Jewish Judaism, and as you're saying, every person, everyone's a Jew. Judaism is a big tent. Everybody, there's there's space for everybody, and everybody in their ways, you know. And reform, the reform movement was started on was started earlier in in the time of the Enlightenment, and as a, ty- a way of thinking that we're gonna try to not assimilate, but we're gonna try to assimilate, and it'll be better for us in the in the anti-Semitism. Whether or not that has planned out, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, and conservative, you know, was a little bit of the after after Jew- the, they they came to America and. The Orthodox wanted to, some people w- wanted to chill it down a little bit, so they went to conservative. And then Orthodox Judaism is really just following the Torah the way it is, has not changed from 
from Moses at Sinai and Moses at Sinai and Moses at Sinai. So it's um, you know, every again, there's place for everybody within Judaism and everybody, every 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 um, every Jew, no matter wh which way, which what they do, which, which which way they serve God, if they're doing a mitzvah, if they're doing something, they're making God happy, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I'll, I will say this for the Jewish community, unlike. You talk to Christians and Catholics and Protestants and Baptists, and they all think the other one's Looney Tunes or that their their sect is weird. You don't see that in Judaism. Like you said, everyone's a Jew, and uh, you look at me as a Reformed Jew, and we're still Jews. There's there's no judgment or difference there. It's more of what, what we have in common than what, we're, than what we have different. Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. Now, there are some things, if you visit Brooklyn on a Friday and you see everyone running around, uh, and I'll show some picture on the, the video podcast if you know what I mean. I'd love to dive into some of those signature items that you can quickly identify that as an Orthodox Jew. That is a ro that's that's someone who's religious. Uh, some of those things like a, a strymel is that am I pronouncing strimal. It? a strymel? Yeah, is is where I'd like to start because I saw a lot of these when I was on the train riding through Brooklyn and met somebody who had one in the train. Mm -hmm. Uh, nice fancy box for it. It looked very expensive. Tell me about this strimal, this big furry hat that the Orthodox community wears. So actually, in our community, in the Chabad community, we don't wear strimals. It's a different. It's different communities within the Orthodox community. Um, different sects within the Orthodox community grew up where, you know, were in different locations all throughout Eastern Europe, um, whether it was Poland or Russia or Hungary or all all around, you know. Mm. And so within and every every rabbi had their direction, their way of serving God, whether it was... So there's a general idea of wearing a covering, a head covering when we pray. Besides the yarmulke, which we'll talk about, so there's... We wear, we wear Orthodox Jews wear a yarmulke all the time, a kippah all the time. But during prayer, we want to wear a second covering. To, mm -hmm. Again, to that connection to respect and awe, the respect and awe we have of God when, while we pray. Um, and remembering that God is above us at all times. That God is ar around us at all times, not just above, everywhere. Um, but so in different communities that covering took on different styles. So in our, it's a, in our community, it's a fedora in Brooklyn all around. Mm. It's the strimal. Some have a top hat. Some have uh, a shorter strimal. Some have a taller strimal. It's a little bit, there's a, there's a, there's a Lots diverse of types of hats. Diverse the hat goal there is, is, is to, have to wear an additional head covering to show your connection to God. Exactly. Beautiful. What, uh, on the yarmulke yes. conversation. Uh, that's something that is probably the most identifiable that people are familiar with. Sure. And I guess the rumor, the stereotype behind the yarmulke is it covers our bald heads. I'm assuming that's not true. Or it covers our horns. Or our horns. Yeah. So Jews have horns. Yeah. People really think that. It's crazy. What is the reason for a yarmulke? Why do we wear yarmulkes all day? So it's actually not a, uh, it's not a mitzvah per se. It's not something that is biblically, uh, um, it's not something that was given over as a mitzvah. It's more of a tradition, as we spoke about. The we wear a covering on our head when we pray, whether we make when we make a blessing, we put on tefillin, or we do any sort of prayer, and that's to show that respect we have for God and to remember that God is above us and God is surrounds us. Um, and it became a tradition um, later on. It became a tradition. It's already been for a while, maybe over over a thousand years, that the Jewish people would start started wearing um, a yarmulke, a kippa, all the time, just to have that constant reminder of God. Um, so it's not, it's a tradition and some people, you know, because it's been a tradition for so long, some people feel that it's therefore obligatory and we should be wearing it all the time, but it's not, um, it's, but it's a, it's a, it's a tradition, which is a beautiful tradition of keeping us separate and keep re realizing who we are. Yes. And at the same time, remembering God. And that tradition seems like it made it into all of the Jewish communities. Yeah. What a, what a successful movement. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, probably the second most identifiable signature of an Orthodox Jew, uh, and not everyone has it, obviously you don't have it, but the peos, the curly sideburns. This one, uh, you explained it to me last time because I asked, but it was a very interesting one. I'd love to hear the reason that Jewish Orthodox communities keep the peos, the curly sideburns. So actually, peos, as you're saying, you're, I do have. I do have peos, and actually you have kind of peos too. <laughs> peos, re re peos really are sideburns, mm -hmm. and... It's a biblical. It's a biblical mitzvah to keep to keep the sideburns on on the side of your on the side of your head side of your, right, right over here. You know there are different opinions. If it should be to your to, to the bone, or if it should go past your ear, and so on. 
and that's the mitzvah of the the commandment is to keep not to cut off your sideburns um and just talk about reasoning for a second is actually most opinions are that it's not for any reason whatsoever it's because god told us and that's why we do it and there are a lot of commandments in in judaism that we do just because hashem told us god told us and it's to solidify our connection with him is that we do these things even though we don't necessarily understand them there's also an idea that to separate us from in the times it was idol worshippers or today it would be the non-jewish regular the non-jewish community is to have sideburns to separate us and to be to say we're different because at the end of the day we have to be proud of that difference that we have in different communities it's just like the strimal in different communities it's become uh, a custom not to cut this not to cut the payos at all and it becomes longer and there's there's sideburns that go all the way down so some communities don't even don't trim them whatsoever their entire life some trim it somewhat um there's again there's all this diverse there's, there's i had a friend who would have long payos but he wouldn't have it down he would tie it under his yarmulke and interesting keep it there so it wasn't yeah. all the way down you know there's all types of um Diverse, there's a diversity in the, in the in the sideburns. Right. Seems like there's a, a few things in the the commandments or the Torah that are, we do it because God said to do it, and it's it's now tradition, it's culture. One of those things, also not on my list, circumcision. So there was a, a funny movie, Year One, where they're basically like going back to the history and how they came up with it. It's like, oh, we gotta chop off our penises, <laughs> get the knife, everyone line up. Uh, it sounds like a crazy one, and now it's something that's been adopted by most of the modern world, at least in America. Uh, what was the reason for circumcision? Why are all Jews circumcised? I believe the ceremony is called a bris. Correct. I'd love to ex uh, explain that for a minute. So bris actually goes all the way back to the first Jew. It's not something which was given at Mount Sinai. It mm. was given at Mount Sinai as well, but a bris goes all the way back to Abraham. And the famous stories when Abraham, the biblical stories when Abraham was 99 years old. And um, God came to him and told him he should give himself a bris. This is the scene from the movie. <laughs> is it? Okay. It's a give great him, scene. Give him, so he should circumcise himself. <laughs> and at the end of the day, the reason is it's a, a bris. Uh, the word bris in Hebrew is a, it's not, it's not just a bond. It's a, there's a word I'm looking for. Um, a bris is a, is a everlasting bond, an everlasting connection between two people and between Jews, Jews and Hashem. And the bris that the circumcision is a way of making that bond on our bodies. You know, we have that. We have it specifically done at eight days old, when a baby is when a baby won't remember it, but it's never. But it's and, and 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 it's done in a way that the pain shouldn't be felt. Yeah, I've actually performed a fair share of circumcisions Already. in my medical training. Okay, and you have maybe you have to teach this. You know, there's special rabbis that like that do it. Uh, that do it. There's like a whole rabbinical. Um, Direction, you know, like how people like for kosher, yeah. there's experts and there's, co there's there's experts in giving circumcisions. It doesn't take rocket science. I don't want to try. But again, I don't want some inexperienced. <laughs> I don't right. want you chopping off my baby's penis. I will definitely not foreskin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a it's a, so this it's this com it's this bond that we have with God that we're able to really um, solidify by having it mm. having it on our own on ourselves. Um, so that's where it comes from. You know, what's cool is it turned out to be something positive and for, for the health of the yeah. penis. Yeah. Well, well, who would have guessed that <laughs> this turned out to be a, a, a lot of times, a you know, positive health decision. But same thing when it comes back to kosher, too. You know, some people nowadays, they say kosher food, kosher food, the healthy food or yeah. kosher food. But at the end like of the what day, what meats are off limits? Pork, the bad one tends to be off limits. So wow. And people think that, you know, maybe that's that's the reason. The reason why God gave us kosher is because of uh, he knew. it's healthy. But at the same time, we have to remember that that's not why. Hashem, they gave, God gave us these commandments as a way of connecting to Him, and they're, it's beautiful if they have if they have uh, side effects, side benefits. But those aren't the those aren't the goal. The goal is to be able to have that connection with yeah. Hashem. Definitely the, interesting. The word mitzvah. We've yeah. been talking about mitzvah a lot. A lot of people get confused. Think mitzvah is a good deed. Mitzvah is a good deed that's in what theory. I thought, that's what I think. But a mitzvah, and really the word mitzvah is from, uh, as the word tzavsa. Tzavsa means to connect. And it's the connection between us and Hashem, us and God. And so God gave us all these different opportunities to uh, to connect to Him. There's a story of somebody who once came to Lobava Cherebi and came to his room and had a meeting with him. And he was a student, I think if I remember correctly, he was a student who was having doubts in his in his in his faith and he was had a bunch of questions. And he came to the Rebbe and he asked the Rebbe, I don't understand. God is this almighty incredible God, you know, created everything from nothing. 
What does he care about the details? What does he care about? I should I should eat this and I shouldn't eat that. I should do this on Shabbat. I shouldn't do that. What does it make a difference to him? And the Rebbe turned to him and the Rebbe said, you know why? He gave you the details because he loves you. He gave you the details because every single detail, every single mitzvah is an opportunity to connect. It's not a restriction. It's not a. It's and, and if you look at it as a restriction, it's an it's an unfortunate thing. We have to realize that these the mitzvot and the commandments that we that we were given are ways to connect to Hashem and make our lives more meaningful. That's a, a really interesting way of looking at it. So yeah. when you see an Orthodox Jew with the talis and the and the peos and the yarmulke and the furry hats, all of those things are opportunities that God gave to be closer to Him. So Absolutely. that's what. In their mind, they think that they're doing or, or are doing in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so very good. I've never actually thought of it that way. Yeah. That's insightful. <laughs> I'd love to end on uh, an interesting topic that I, I've had recently with my girlfriend, who's not Jewish. Uh, we, we joke about it sometimes, but converting to Judaism. So this is something that's not necessarily easy to do like it is in other religions. And even once you go through the steps and do it, most people in Jewish communities still won't consider that person Jewish. Talk to me briefly about the process of converting to Judaism, and does that make somebody a Jew? Um, it has to be done intently with the, with that with a clear intent. That's the reason you're doing it. it takes time, um, and it's not an easy process. And so, if you do it that way, then you'll be accepted. The person that would that would convert properly would be accepted by all all different communities. Unfortunately, there are communities who have in recent years, decided that that's not necessarily the way to do it, and unfortunately, in those in those in those scenarios, that conversion is not accepted by uh, by mainstream Judaism by all the different. One other thing that Judaism may have gotten right is passing down Judaism from the mother's side. This is something mm -hmm. that's recognized by the Jewish community, and in medicine, we learn that mitochondrial DNA is passed down from the mother's side and stays within a family line for long periods of time. Uh, so maybe God, whoever or said that, knew, knew about the mitochondrial DNA. Likely. Very <laughs> interesting. Uh, so uh, if my girlfriend wanted to convert to Judaism, what is that process like? How many years of school? Where does she go? Who does she talk to? So she would have to decide if she wanted to convert to Judaism. It wouldn't be because of you. She needs not, to get approved. Not just, be, not just because. And, and the reason she has to decide she wants to do it for herself. Hmm. She has to decide, I like Jay and all, but... Um, that's not why I want to become Jewish. I want to become Jewish because I feel, for whatever reason, that Judaism is my calling. And I don't necessarily encourage it because it takes a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot to it. And you have to live in a, in order to convert properly, you'd have to live in a, in a, in a, in a Jewish community where there are Jewish resources mm. to be able to do those things. And you would have to, I mean, you know, the, I know people that are going through that process now, you know, whether it's in South Florida or in Israel. Um, and it's, it's a long learning process of a year or two. Um, until eventually, at the at final at the final approval and final uh, and final stage, a person does that ritual does a ritual bath um, called the mikvah, and where they officially become a Jew. They That's did the mikvah in process. Israel. Got naked, jumped in the water with a bunch of other Jewish Jewish guys. It was it was awesome. Yep, very cool. Okay, yes. so it's years of work. Yeah, and need to be in a Jewish community. It's so interesting that the Jewish community makes it so difficult to convert. You'd think. As a, as a business, as a growing corporation, you'd have a, a machine. Like, you want to be a Jew? <laughs> uh, I forget what they call it in the, the, the Christian Catholic religion. They do the, the dunk, you're, boom, now, yeah. you're, now you're Catholic. Uh, so I think that goes to show about Judaism. Like, uh, as opposed to other religions who are going door to door trying to sign you up, the Jewish community is like, you sure? Let's screen you. Let's make sure your head's on right. Let's make sure you got the right reasoning. Now go through two years of schooling and to to finally be acknowledged as a jew by by these communities so responsibility to be a jew it's not uh, it's not easy it's not e it's, e it's a prideful and we and it's it's a, it's a joy but at the same time it's not something which uh, comes light-handed just true that ain't easy being a jew mendel i'm israel chai right yeah i'm israel chai Rabbi Mendel, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. It was a blast. I look forward to many more years of building the Jewish community in St. Pete alongside you. Amen. Uh, let's do Same. some tefillin. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for having me.